Ladies and gentlemen, greetings and welcome to Screen Scene, the show where I will review a movie or TV show. I'm your host, Zelrix, and today we'll be watching The Treasure Planet. Unless your parents completely screwed up your childhood, there's a good chance that when you were young, Disney was omnipresent. We all have our favorite classic of Disney. For most people, we hear The Lion King, Aladdin, and other Little Mermaid. But if you're like me, your favorite Disney movie is also the most underrated, Treasure Planet. In 2002, back in the day, it totally crashed, though. The Los Angeles Times even describing it as one of the worst box office bomb of all time. Obviously, there must be a reason for that. What makes the success, or in that case, the anti-success of a movie is really touchy. It can be the bad advertising, the loss of interest from the public, or plain out that the movie is trash. I'm looking at you with all my power, Pirate of the Caribbean 5! For Treasure Planet, the second option is the most likely. After the box office bomb that was Atlantis, and the fact that the public said Pocahontas butchered American history, which it totally did, then there was also the hunchback of Notre Dame. I don't know who decided that it was a good idea to adapt the grim tales of Victor Hugo into a children movie, but that person is both the stupidest and bravest person in human history. Meanwhile, the catastrophic production of The Emperor New Groove didn't help anything. Long story short, that was a really dark age for Disney and the public started losing faith. What saved Disney, in my opinion, was either Lilo and Stitch or the fact that they finally decided to buy Pixar. But almost 20 years later today, the fans and Disney have been reconciliated, so maybe it's time to give it another try. So let's take a look at Treasure Planet. The film opens on a beautiful night sky where a space pirate boat is riding. Because yes, this movie is also the book adaptation of Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island. You might not know this, but Treasure Island is pretty much the basics for every pirate story. The character of Long John Silver is the character that set up pirates as having a wooden leg and a parrot. Here we are told the story of Captain Nathaniel Flint, a space pirate that would have buried his treasure somewhere in the galaxy. But turns out the story was read by our main character, James Hawkins. James Pleiades Hawkins. I thought you were asleep an hour ago. Jim lives alone with his mother, and obviously it's a Disney movie, so who says protagonist says absent parents? Flash forward 12 years later when James is surfing in the clouds with his solar board and also destroying public property. That might be why the film wasn't acclaimed by parents all along. James is pure chaos. He's a rebel, he destroys things that don't belong to him, and he gets arrested. So yeah, James isn't exactly a model to follow for kids. There is being an adrenaline junkie, but then there's also being purely suicidal. Look at that, he just broke into a power plant, he's surfing through the mechanism. Please someone arrest him and oh thank you! Moving violation 904, section 15, paragraph... Um... Six? Thank you. Don't mention it. That's also why I like Jim, he's a smartass among smartasses. He makes Eric Foreman looks like Steve Smith. Any more slip-ups will result in a one-way ticket to Juvenile Hall. That might seem harsh, but at least there was no police brutality. Aladdin, take some notes. It is established that James' mom is a waitress struggling to pay her bill, but the scenario intervened in the form of a pirate crashing in their property. I keep dreaming one day I'll open that door, and there he'll be just the way he was. Smiling, happy little boy, holding a new pet, and begging me to let him keep it. <laughs> Well, be careful what you wish for, lady. The pirate tells James not to trust the cyborg, but luckily, there are no cyborgs in sight, and oh, look at that, a pirate cyborg just raided the restaurant, burning everything the Hawkins ever possessed. James managed to save the map the pirate was carrying to, what else, the actual treasure planet. James and the Dr. Doppler embark into an epic quest to find the treasure with Captain Amelia and her second in command, Mr. Arrow. The temptation of making an Oliver Queen joke gets stronger every minute. I don't much care for this crew you hired. A ludicrous parcel of driveling galoots, ma'am. There you go, poetry. Okay, so Amelia, you might have warned them about that before they embarked the ship with a priceless map. Why did Amelia agree to this crew? I guess she wasn't consulted, but look at that. They look like somebody crashed into a high criminality city and hired the people with the less stabbing scar above the waist down. We then meet Mr. Silver, the ship's cook, and oh, I wonder, is it the cyborg that raided the restaurant? Silver is charming, he's funny, he's nice, with some cannibalistic tendencies. Ah! <laughs> 
In fact, that was part of the old family. Hey, no one's perfect. Morph! You ziggered head and... Oh yeah, Morph. Morph is, uh... Morp is perfect, okay? Morp is hilarious. I want more of Morp. I'm gonna get a tattoo of Morp. Morp is the most incredible comedic relief in cinema's history. So long story short, Jim is the new assistant to Mr. Silver and neither of them seems to be very happy at first. Because yes, Silver eventually become the father figure to Jim. His real dad having bailed on him and his mom years ago. That's fine if you take out the murderous tendencies of Silver. Because yes, Treasure Planet is a kid's movie, but for a kid's movie, the level of writing of these characters is really, really deep. But that said, the movie tends to sell Silver way too much as a good guy, while in reality, he did burn Jim's house and almost killed him in the beginning of the movie. So what's there to take away that problem? Jim is. The entire character arc of Jim is learning to trust people, even learning to trust and forgive himself sometimes. So by letting Silver in his life, they both get a little bit better with time. And that is good character development. Problem is, the film needs an antagonist. So now that we have learned to love Mr. Silver, the new antagonist is revealed as Mr. Croup. Croup has a very nice design and honestly, he is scary, but he is not nearly present enough to get on anyone's top 10 list of favorite Disney antagonists. Eventually, the ship is hit by a supernova, Croup kills Mr. Arrow and finds a way to make it pass as an accident on Jim's fault. Here we have a big problem in a big quality. Mr. Arrow was a... <clears throat> fine spacer. Finer than most of us. Could ever hope to be. Amelia is really convincing in her grief for Mr. Arrow, but it's a kid's movie and a kid will not get their asses sit in a movie theater chair for two and a half hours. This movie is one hour and 35 minutes long. Even though most main characters are extremely well developed, Mr. Arrow and other side characters could use an extra 10 or 15 minutes of screen time. If that had been the case, I'd say that even today, the death of Mr. Harrow would have been entered as one of the most gruesome and saddest Disney deaths, all up there with Mufasa's death. But sadly, that's not the case. The only reason that makes me care about Mr. Harrow's death is the fact that he had a few great scenes and that Emma Thompson is extremely convincing as Captain Amelia, especially in her farewell speech to an old friend. Too bad these moments are so few. Jim spies on the pirates and discovers that they are preparing a mutiny. Are wanting to move! We don't move till we got the treasure in hand! Seriously, Jim, have you seen those pirates? Scooby Doo could have cracked that case. Jim Dupler and Amelia managed to escape the mutiny, but Jim lost the map and left it on the ship. Silver doesn't realize it and starts chasing them in order to retrieve the map. On the planet, Jim meets Ben, the robot of Captain Flynn himself, and perhaps the only conscience being to know where the treasure is buried. Only problem? I re remember. I do. I do. Treasure! Lots of treasure! Buried in it! Ben is mad. Turns out they did land on the actual treasure planet though, so Ben takes the crew back to his place and Silver confronts Jim. If we play our cards right, we can both walk away from this rich as king. It's been 19 years and still today I can't decide whether Jim should or should not trust Silver in this scene. It is obvious that Silver cares about Jim and that Jim cares about Silver, but it's also obvious that Silver will stop at nothing to get the treasure. Anyway, only important thing, Jim decides not to trust him. Jim sneaks back into the ship to retrieve the map, but has to go through Mr. Croup before. So Jim sent Mr. Croup flying into space. Yes, our main character, who is a teenager, just killed someone and isn't scarred at all. Also, for the last 30 minutes, we need an antagonist. So Silver decides to make Jim trade the map for his friend's life. But we learn that the map is also a key capable of opening a door that leads anywhere in the universe. And Jim figures out that the treasure is stashed within the surface of this planet. <laughs> How a character as smart as Jim ever had any trouble defeating these idiots is beyond me. Unfortunately, the treasure has been booby trapped and Silver decides to do a complete 180, saving Jim's life over the treasure. Jim crafts a new solar board, he finally opened the doors, they escaped the explosion with mere seconds to live, Jim lets Silver live, he rebuilds his house and his restaurant, and our main character all live happily ever after. So that was Treasure Planet. 
really good storytelling. The editing is decent, very well developed characters, but honestly, this animation! There is something with merging CGI with classic animation that is just gorgeous to my eyes. Plus, have you seen those colors? The chromatic effect is godlike. Let's not forget the chemistry and the father-son relationship between characters like Jim and Silver that is not only believable, but really touching. But maybe that's why it bombed. When you're a little kid, you're too young to understand the nuance of grey in the world. Scar and Jafar are good villains because they are easy to identify as the antagonist. Here, Silver is a really good character and dare I say, an amazing antagonist that ends up on the protagonist's side. But for a kid, it's a bit hard to understand. Plus, it's obvious that we're not in a classic Disney exit, the magical fairy tale for a science fiction space opera story. The musical moments are all sang by the original songwriter of the songs, rather than being sang in a traditional musical like Aladdin or The Lion King. But seeing as how Disney was bombing year after years back then, I think that they were indeed looking for something different, and they got it. Plus, it came out a week after Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, so at this point, Disney, that's just bad timing. Long story short, Treasure Planet is the most underrated Disney classic of all time, and even if it bombed at the box office, it doesn't mean that it isn't a wonderful story merged with some gorgeous visuals. I'm not saying it's perfect and that everybody will like this film. No movie is that good, except The Shawshank Redemption, of course. But if you want to do yourself a favor, give it a second chance, you might have a pretty good time.